Es esmu sveicināt lampām. Lampas virs tēma kopējais lielais rāms, par ko mēs šogad runājam lampā, ir ietekme un cieņa. Impacts and research is the uh, overall idea of uh, Lampa Festivals Lampa this year and uh, we are going into the in uh, to this frame we are at uh, stage Pietro 2030 mēs šeit esam uh, skatuvis Pietro 2030 starp citu uh, diskusija vai aprits ekonomiku būvniecībā ir modē ir mūsu diskusijas tēma saruna gan notiks uh, pat diskusija notiks uh, angļu valodā tā kā ja gadījumā jums kādam vajadzēs palīdzību pacelēt roku šeit uh, rut kas parka personāls mēģinās jums palīdzēt, bet tāpēc arī informācija, kuru es tūdaļu stāstīšu, būs angliski. Um, discussion green buildings, how to build according to the principles of uh, circular economy. Circular, from circle, it means it goes around and comes back in a different form. That is what we are talking about. And if we talk about the whole frame, they is more than clear that uh, many of the human activities are very negative environmentally and no one really doubts that uh, if you really follow the uh, topic then currently we are in a very uncertain situation and in the journey to an unknown territory our future and it is very good that we have some stops on the way and Pietro 2030 is one of those stops one of the stops in the near future towards a hopefully better and more sustainable world. And the question is, how to get there? That's the question, overall question we are trying to solve. And today, the session Green Buildings, how to build according to the principles of circular economy is supported by Embassy of the Kingdom of Netherlands. And maybe we have also a um, Netherlands uh, ambassador designate your Excellency Claudia Petis. Uh, Claudia, are you here today? Claudia? Or maybe um, um, other people which are not here are watching us live. So, let us see who are participants. The first, uh, a little bit on the construction sector. Uh, it is a sector that attracts and consumes the most energy and environmental resources worldwide. 40% of global energy consumption, 40% and uh, generates more than 35% of all waste generated in the EU. That's uh, the figures we are talking about. The Green Deal, we will also touch today, motivates to calculate the ecological footprint for construction. And we will be talking about what are the best practices in the design, construction and management of environmentally friendly buildings? That's one question. How to build the buildings using the principles of circular economy? That's another question. How can we improve existing buildings and make better use of them? And how to make it sustainably and uh, more or less cheap? Is it possible? And uh, what are the jobs to be done? And is it trendy? Because yes, it is trendy at Lampa. We like to talk about uh, sustainability and environmentally friendly. But is it trending also outside Lampa? Those are the questions. So now let's see uh, our participants. Uh, there are two gentlemen on the screen and they will be joining in from far, far away. And that's a great thing. You don't have to come over and uh, spend the energy and add to the problem. So Rob Oman, circular economy expert, is uh, one of our experts far from far away. Please wave, Rob. Yes. Hi there. Good afternoon. And a leading researcher at Riga Technical University Institute of Materials and Structures and head of 3D Concrete Printing Scientific Laboratory, Mar Shinka. Hello. Thank you, yes. Jens. And I'm reading 3D Concrete Printing Scientific Laboratory. That sounds like, I don't know, Century 23 or something. <laughs> no, no, it's today. Wow. Yeah, it's today. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, wow. And we have some uh, two WOW experts also here on spot next to me. Marie Katrin, Marie Katrin Damb, sustainable architect at Nomad Architects, specialized in the field of circular economy. Marie, or Marie Katrin. And sustainable architect. Sustainable architect, that sounds great. 
Jan Sikonix, director of Riga Energy Agency. Yeah. yeah, hello everybody. So, we are ready to move on, but a little bit more on who are you and what you are doing. Um, we will also give you two minutes each to present um, on the topic, what is the thing you would like to announce, where we can start discussion from. Um, but we will begin with one picture on the screen. Please take a look. Paskatāmies uz bildi uz ekrānu, lūdzu. Bildi uz ekrāna. Yep. Dear Gazir Shait, if you are here, you've seen it and probably asked yourself, what is that? And that is the question. What is it and where we can find it? Kas tas ir un kur mēs to varam atrast? So, what, what, what is it? Okay, yes, you can point. Yes, and what's the name? Kas tas ir? Šūpols. All right, let's see if our public is correct. A shoe ball is, in English means swings. It's an object, uh, swings, named Station Rutska in the territory of Rutska Manor near the stage Pietro 2030. We can see it from here. And um, that installation consists of wooden scaffolding for five nearly four meter high swings with seating elements and the planters in between. It is built mainly using of actual building waste in the construction. So, Maria, are you saying that's a construction waste? I wouldn't say it's a waste, I would say it's material. Yep, that's the difference, how we look at it. And this object is designed by Nomad Architects and Representative Maria Katrin Dambe is here. So, if you have anything to say about that object, here she is. So that is just one example of what we are talking about in the circular uh, economy. But before we begin, let's see a little bit more on our participants. Circular economy expert from the Netherlands, Rob Orman, has been working on the circular economy for over seven years in various occupations. Currently, he works as international business development manager for company Madaster. He's part-time consultant at Turnto and contributes at special, uh, as special envoy, envoy for Holland Circular Hotspot, promoting circular practices worldwide. I have to tell you, Rob, even uh, plenty of these names and, and uh, terms are a little bit alien for me. Uh, and that's why I would like to ask you, seven years, it's not a lot. It, it looks like a new trend. So, uh -huh. what is so special about uh, that circular economy, especially in construction field? Um, well, circular economy in general, the term circular economy is relatively new. I would say um, circularity itself is the most natural thing that we can do, and uh, the, the Earth has been doing that um, for as long as we know. Um, if you look at a circular economy in the construction industry uh, in the past 100 years, I would say buildings have been less and less designed for the, per, the per products and materials in there to be reused um, at some point. Less and, and less designed. Less and less designed. Be yes, yes, because oftentimes from um, um, people that I know who work in the demolition industry, so to take buildings down, they often say like buildings designed in 1930 and so on have often been designed in a better way, intentionally or unintentionally, to be taken um, apart. Brick by brick. The type of, yeah, in terms of the type of materials that were used and the way everything was put together in one place. And we have moved from like this to a, ma to a mass... Uh, 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 um, a mass level of construction with all new types of materials and innovations that improve a lot in terms of well-being and comfort and so on, but for a long time has not taken into account the environmental perspective and the reuse perspective. So, but it lo looks like uh, people have been planning those buildings for hundreds and hundreds of years, why you have to take them apart? Well, there will be one day in the uh, the founder of the company I work for always says, like, everything on our earth, everything on our earth, or especially us, we are um, temporary beings on our earth. So even though in, in our 
perspective of an hour life perspective, a building might be there for the long term. In the end, everything is here on a temporary base, and we should make things in such a way that they can be returned safely to the earth in whichever moment or whichever form. So do you believe that uh, buildings which are constructed in a way they can be taken apart more easily uh, can be as uh, long-living as the ones built from, uh, from concrete and iron and, and glass? Mm, well, I would not... The materials you are naming um, are very good materials and I uh, see them still having a role uh, in circular economy as well. I think what we should be focusing on more is, for example, uh, in Holland, there is millions of tons of construction waste every single year. And one element during the construction phase on what is being w w w w w wasted as well. And secondly, we do demolish a lot of buildings. For example, in um, industrial areas where we have built certain industrial parks, that after 20 years, those buildings have been built very strong, but not in an adaptable way. So when there was a certain... Um, factory or type of company over there that is not there anymore. It is very hard to adapt these buildings to a new f f function. For example, if you look at the, the, the old buildings we have in um, Amsterdam eh, that are very beautiful historic buildings of 400 years old, their roofs are very high and the width of the buildings is in a certain way that it can be used for a home, for an office. And are, in that sense, on the internal space, relatively adaptable. And we have designed many buildings that are not so adaptable. And I think that is much more the topic. And material use is an important element, of course, as well. Um, but I wouldn't write off the materials that you mentioned just now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mar Schinke, leading researcher at Riga Technical University, Institute of Materials and Structures, and uh, head of 3D Concrete Printing Scientific Laboratory, Maris was uh, nodding uh, very often when listening to you, Rob, and agreeing. So you're on the same page there. Maris is currently, uh, currently developing new types of building materials using waste products. He also performs life cycle assessment of newly development uh, and uh, traditional building materials to assess and compare their impact on the environment. So Maris is the one to ask uh, what materials should be used, how to put them uh, together in the best way. Maris, you, your two minutes on why you are in this field and uh, what is the most important thing you should, uh, we should do about it. Mm -hmm. uh, before I start, yeah, I would uh, definitely like to uh, agree with Rob uh, on the on the uh, these old buildings. So the best way to uh, to yeah, uh, reduce your environmental impact is like. Uh, don't demolish the old buildings and don't build new buildings. So that's uh, that's the way that we can reduce it uh, the I impact most significantly. And if we design new buildings, we need to design them uh, adaptably. So uh, for the future, we can uh, we don't need to de demolish them for uh, after 30 years. Uh, but uh, but regarding my research and what we are doing at Riga Technical University, so uh, we are. Uh, uh, yeah, research and developing a new kind of building materials in, in, in the context of circular economy. A lot of these materials are using waste products or byproducts from uh, different industries. It's uh, either uh, agricultural or energy generation or fer fertilizer production industries, as well as we have uh, some new products, uh, projects on, on uh, construction demolition waste uh, incorporation into new materials. Uh, as you also mentioned, I am a uh, head of a uh, 3D concrete printing laboratory. Uh, 3D concrete printing can also play a role uh, in, a, in a circular economy, but only if we do it in a correct way. Because if you see these tradition, let's say traditional, like two-year-old uh, concrete buildings being printed, they are uh, not so easily uh, to, easy to disassemble. It's a monolithic uh, structure, but if we uh, build some modular construction or do it for a rapid prototyping, then definitely 3D printing can play a, a role in a circular construction. As you yeah, mentioned, I'm also, uh, uh, my field of work is also this uh, assessment of uh, uh, environmental impact on, of uh, building materials. And uh, that is one topic that uh, I will, will like to discuss uh, later on, uh, because uh, not all the time environment and uh, environmental impact goes 
together with circular economy, uh, circular construction. If we if we look, for example, uh, environmental impact today, yeah, because we want a low CO2 em emissions today, but if we build uh, circular buildings, they might uh, produce a little bit more CO2 emissions, and we need to, need to uh, think how to balance that. Uh, I have also been working as a construction uh, supervisor recently, uh, re uh, previously uh, in the like uh, classical traditional construction uh, sites. So I have like a hands-on experience uh, uh, about the main uh, stakeholders uh, there. So the customer, the other contractors, how how they are thinking, how they are thinking about uh, circular economy or or recycling at least. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marshinka, and uh, we will come back, of course, uh, to the question on uh, how to be sustainable. Also, yes, you are reusing things, but sometimes people say, you know what, reusing things take more energy than building new ones or creating new ones. So it's a quite complicated, also full cycle thing to talk about. Uh, we will come back to that. But now let's uh, meet uh, Marie Katrin Dambe, sustainable architects at Nomad Architects, specialized in the field of circular economy. Uh, Marie, Katrin, um, it's quite a hard thing to be sustainable architect because you have to be sustainable in your architecture and in your way of life. Are you both, I would like to ask? Uh, I'm definitely trying that, but of course, in all fields, you, you try, you fail, you try again. So it's about only trying to do better would be the probable answer. To ensure that the suggested methods uh, or solutions do not stay only on the level of theory in company Nomad Architects tries to practice hands-on principle and be actively involved also in the building processes to establish a reliable connection between multiple building fields professionals. So you are trying to pull together all sorts of specialists which are working in this field and try to find a consensus on how things should be done? Yeah, that would be quite well described. So, as an architect, you are the one who plans a building, but that how you plan affects how someone can use it, and also later disassemble, uh, and again, reuse the components. Or also as an architect, you are the one who might take the reused material and have to plan it in the things. So, you're only one part of the chain. So it's actually a large teamwork with multiple uh, fields coming together. And uh, that what we try to do is um, to not be detached from those and stay in active uh, discussion uh, with all those involved professions. And sometimes it means actually self-building things or standing next to the builder and doing or being at a demolition or something to really um, exchange the experience and learn from that. Uh, if I would be a client of yours, it would be very strange for me if you would come to me and say, you know what, let's think about how we will demolish your building. And uh, at the very beginning, it's like, what? Really? Come on, relax. I'm building that. I need it for, for building, not for demolishing. How many clients of yours are really thinking on, on that end phase of the building or construction? I would say because we uh, position ourselves as sustainable architects, the clients usually are aware of what we might bring up in the topic. <laughs> it's not a surprise for them. I would say not. I have to ask them. But um, it's the thing is not that we immediately speak with the client, we're going to take down your building. That's not the point. It's about understanding the statistics, understanding how long actually a building stands. And if we look at this life cycle assessment, we look at 50, 60 years of a building lifetime. Only? Yeah. Um, Why? That is the, probably someone can comment better, but that's the data we use for calculating the footprint of a building. It's some average uh, lifetime. What is, please help me to understand. What is the problem? Why those buildings can't stand uh, like 200, 500 years like buildings we are surrounded by at the moment? Um... It's, there are buildings also which stand that long, but there are also buildings which stand only five or ten years because of actual function and need changes. And this what was mentioned already before, the buildings cannot be adapted or refurbished in a way that makes them useful again, so they have to be taken down and something else has to be built that fits the needs. Uh, anybody can comment, please? Uh, what is the lifespan of the average building right now? For example, 
living homes or, or, or uh, office uh, spaces or whatever, uh, warehouses, what is the uh, average plan for the building built today? Just to know, just to understand. Anybody? I would. I can. Uh, I cannot comment on the actual numbers. Uh, I don't have that statistics. But the uh, but the idea is uh, uh, that mostly the buildings taken down are not due to the uh, the uh, damage or some uh, wear and tear of the building. It's due to uh, changes uh, like uh, uh, our demands for the building. So uh, if we ma maintain the construction, as you as, yeah, you are sitting at the Ruts Rutskas Park. The, the building there is uh, quite old, and if we ma maintain the buildings correctly, they can stand for uh, extremely long periods. Uh, just uh, uh, we uh, today we have an experience that uh, most probably the, the lifespan won't be well until recently we had we had the experience that lifespan won't be that long because there will be some changes and somebody after uh, 60 years will uh, want to tear this building up, uh, down, which. Is not the, I think, the best way how to, uh, yeah, approach buildings. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I would like to, to add, if I may, uh, what we see uh, when we create material passports of buildings, we see that you also have to look at a building in the different layers of a building. Yeah? Like Mar um, Maris is saying, the construction and uh, the 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 foundation of the building for it to stand can last 100, 200 years, but you have the outer layers of the building from an aesthetic perspective internally. Eh? If the function changes, you have to break walls, you have to paint, you have to do all sorts of things on the inside of the building. Uh, the um, climate-related installations as well, um, insulation. Eh? If you take um, social housing in the Netherlands that was built 60, 70 years ago, that is still standing today has single layered glass, needs to be isolated better. The isolation in between the walls was or maybe wasn't even there, has to find a solution to add that. So because of all those changing circumstances, continuously a lot of work is being done to keep the building in an um, operable state, and you're taking out materials, and ideally you should be able to bring those materials back into the cycle again, and that is what is very difficult um, today in the way b uh, buildings have been designed. Is, is the way, for example, if the building is built as a Lego, where you can put uh, uh, one parts out and other parts in, and it still stays and works in a different function, different way, is that also a circular economy? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, if, if I may? Uh, yeah. Or um, yes, I know yes from the perspective that you build it, in a m m modular way, so you can take apart little elements, yeah. but you will also have to look at those elements themselves. What kind of materials are they made of? Are they, you could cycle them, but if they contain um, m many toxic elements, are you being su uh, s sustainable? Mm -hmm. It's a thing you should ask yourself. And if you can take it apart in elements, are you able, are those elements designed in such a way that if in some point those elements are not needed anymore, yeah. you can bring it back to the raw materials it was made from. And those Thank are you. additional considerations. And now let's talk about the energy. Because one thing is materials, other is uh, architecture, the third one is specialists which are working on the, all this. But now we have uh, also the expert in energy efficiency and sustainable development. Jans uh, has experience in private and public sectors related to energy efficiency, renewable energy, sources, circular economy, district heating and other. So he has been involved in development of building life cycle assessment and reduction of environmental impact. So he really knows everything on full circle, all the energy, all the... Uh, all the materials and uh, stuff. Jan Sikaonek, director of Riga Energy Agency, and Jan, so you already had comment on what we've been talking about. Yes, thank you. So, I actually think that uh, your question regarding the lifespan of the building is very complex because uh, it's, it's very hard to determine for the old buildings uh, of what the lifespan of, of them. And of course, as colleagues mentioned, uh, 
it's not only because they are physically damaged uh, or uh, that uh, the materials do not uh, um, uh, that they are old or something like that, but we have researched also a lot of new things that, for example, how indoor climate impacts uh, our health, uh, uh, our needs have been changed, and, uh, and and these are a lot of factors which impact uh, why our buildings uh, are not suitable for our purposes anymore. And I think this is one of the things uh, which we need to look very complexly and, and, and more deeper. And uh, of course, there are buildings, as, as Marie told, that uh, which needs to be renovated because uh, it, it, they were constructed poorly. And uh, this is uh, regarding maybe our multi-apartment residential buildings and all these factors come together there. But uh, the, the circular economy principles are exactly uh, the, to avoid all these things in the future and uh, that we are able to use these buildings afterwards like for 100 or maybe 200 years. That we, we know that, okay, now we will need this building for, for these purposes. But for example, if you would, would li like to change the, the usage of the building, that it would be done more easily and that we do not need to, to demolish this building and to build a new one, that we, it's more easily done in the same building. So and this was the comment, I think, that it's a very, very complex question regarding mm -hmm. uh, the lifespan of the, of, the, of the old buildings. Okay, and Yanis, on, uh, on the energy. So energy agency, what energy agency does and uh, what is your like everyday work and how it adds to circular economy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So uh, RIG Energy Agency, we are responsible for strategic planning of, uh, of energy and also climate uh, actions in, in, in the city of Riga. And, uh, and uh, now we are uh, developing sustainable energy and, uh, and uh, climate action plan. And this will be the, the framework of the, of the city of Riga, how we will move towards uh, climate neutrality. And it seems that climate neutrality is very something con uh, not understandable and the definition maybe is not known, but it, uh, underneath uh, there's uh, practical actions which, from which all people can, can benefit. And, uh, and for us, it's very important that uh, we work to, together with, with everybody and that we see these things complexly, not only energy, but also climate and, and uh, construction and, and all other things. And uh, therefore, circular economy principles are, uh, it's, it's very important that we can implement these things in, in our city uh, because this, these are the solutions which are are already there, but we are not using them. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the, the main uh, main factor, what we need to do, is actually change the behavior. So there's no practical reason why we cannot um, uh, purchase uh, buildings which are n not uh, not, not uh, impacting the environment, but store storing uh, like CO2 emissions, for example. Not, not only like it does impact, but this gives actually benefit for the environment, and, and this is just the, the matter of what we need as a, as a customer, what we what we ask for for people like Maria to to, des to design. And uh, an energy agencies, we are the organization in Riga which <laughs> is pushing these things and uh, which we, how we, we are planning how to implement these things mm -hmm. in, in Riga city. Thank you. Um, you will also have an opportunity to ask questions or raise your hand and say, I, I don't agree. Or you just use menti.com. Menti.com is a platform where you can uh, use the code. And code is 28372075. Here's the code on the screen. And you can write questions uh, or subjections or objections there. It's 28372075 and menti.com. I will have those questions here on my phone, and uh, if we will have time, we will ask them. Um, in a moment, I will ask uh, Rob to tell what are the circular economy principles in the construction sector and to share examples on some trends from the Netherlands in a moment. But before that, I have to ask you all. We are talking about principles which should be used uh, for circular economy and uh, in the construction field. But I have to ask you, do we know from at this point all the principles? Because, for example, now we're starting to think about CO2 levels indoors. Uh, suddenly, uh, some long time ago, we found out that asbestos is not good, which was quite very good uh, material to be used. Then, uh, we, do we know everything about recyclability or reusability of materials? So, 
are we at the point where we can say we know all the mathematics as there was one point in time? Anybody? So, because what we can uh, create is that we're thinking now that this is the way to go, then in 10 years we found ourselves that we didn't know everything and we have to recalculate it all over again. Uh, yeah, I, I can uh, comment on this. Um, uh, of course, we have to understand today that we don't know everything, and that and that is that is okay. Yeah, we are learning every day, and there will be new challenges uh, in ten years, and that's why this uh, uh, way uh, that circular economy principle of uh, uh, adaptability of the buildings is so important. That after ten years, when you will have uh, a, a new uh, new set of demands for the building uh, or for the material, you can take. The, the, the ones out if it is necessary uh, easily. Yeah? It's not like uh, everything is glued together and, and you have to take the building apart. So, uh, no, I would say we don't know, but, uh, but if we use uh, the principles of circular e economy, uh, we can avoid those mistakes being uh, uh, so large. Okay, Janis? Uh, yeah, I can relate completely with Mark's talk now and also before that. From my point of view, I think that it's very important that uh, we start to uh, to assess uh, impact on the whole building life cycle, and this, that's what Marx told about environmental impact assessment. That already now, uh, uh, for example, I have different opinion than you or some other people who are um, uh, purchasing or constructing new buildings, and also Mary has her insights, and I think that we need to somehow. Uh, push this impact uh, assessment uh, that everybody can see on, on calculations, on, on, on scales, what kind of materials are better for, for each case. And, uh, and this is what we are not doing for in, in uh, standard for all of the buildings. And uh, I think then it would be more, uh, we can see more about what, what's better and what's not. And then we can, we have more information to make our decisions. And, uh, and the, I think that, that is needed, and then we can go forward. Mm -hmm. uh, Maria, by the way, you're working with uh, specialists, all sorts of specialists in this field. Can you say that we have uh, enough knowledge, or do those specialists have enough knowledge, and uh, what is the gap? Um, definitely, there can be always more knowledge, but uh, there's enough available uh, information to actually start doing those things, exactly what was said, and if we assess this life cycle of buildings and look at those things, those we can analyze, and that gives us this extra information. And then this idea that we um, build buildings that can be disassembled, so it's this design for disassembly, what's the strategy, uh, we can always yeah, correct those mistakes in case we did something like that. Mm -hmm. So we have this idea as how we can build it, and we can calculate and look at that, is it working or not. So we have right now enough to start doing it. Mm -hmm. um, of course, over time we will uh, gain more information and, and see what works, what doesn't work, but we have to start doing it to actually know that. All right, we will not wait until the moment everything is known for 100%. Yeah. All right, so let's start with the presentation, and uh, Rob Oman uh, will show us presentation on what are the circular economy principles in the construction sector, and uh, we'll share some examples and some trends from the Netherlands. So, uh, Rob. Welcome, yes. you're on. I am uh, sharing my screen. Yes, see everything yep, we can see it. The other day. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, well, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, I, uh, well, I cannot see you in the audience, but I hope you can see and hear me uh, well. Um, over the next uh, 10, 10, 15 minutes or so, I'll um, go over uh, some circular economy trends that we have in the Netherlands at the moment, and of course specifically zooming in on the construction industry. Um, well, I've been introduced already, so very rapidly, well, adding to it, uh, working in it for over seven years now, uh, kind of when it started, uh, I was happy to be uh, to be one of, of the first joining as an employee the team of um, 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 Holland Circular Hotspot, to set that up and to promote uh, these uh, circular directs around the world. Now I'm very happy to see that in many countries around the world there are um, hotspots where circular economy is being uh, promoted. Uh, as international development manager for Modaster, 
Uh, Modastro, very brief, is a, is a platform uh, where we enable the construction industry to generate material um, pep, 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 um, pep, pep, um, passports, material passports of buildings uh, with the objective of identifying uh, all the, the, the elements and the materials that are in buildings. Because if we don't have the information on, on what we already have, it will be hard to reuse that uh, when the time comes. Um, for today's presentation, um, four elements I'd like to go over with you is what does circularity mean for the construction industry? So what are some of the principles, uh, and in my personal view, important principles to take into account to move towards circularity in the industry? What is the history and future of circular economy in the ne Netherlands? So a focus on where did we come from and how did it start? Uh, and where are we now, and where are we, um, what are we going to do? Uh, what are some best practices in the construction industry? So some real examples of what has already been done. And lately, that's more uh, uh, aimed towards you in the audience, uh, what is the um, potential for you, and what if you don't like? Let's get started. Um, I think Throughout the presentation, imagine a building of which its materials can be reused over and over again. Uh, and the phrase underneath that following the principles of nature is only a logical thing. Because if you look at the earth, there is no waste on the earth. Every, uh, the leaves that fall from a tree are, are feedstock again for other um, organisms on the planet. Um, just to give a quick example, uh, and that is what, what we have to uh, aim to achieve uh, with a circular economy as well. So what does circular economy mean, circularity mean for the construction industry? I think design for reuse is a very important one. It starts with the design of things, because uh, if we don't think upfront what we can do with it later, basically how it is done now, something has become waste. And then we look at that waste and say like, hey, can we still maybe do something with this? No. Nah. And then oftentimes you get to suboptimal re re recycling solutions and so on. And if you design up front for reuse, yeah, so that you don't even have to start recycling, eventually you will. Um, th that are one of the basic elements um, for the construction industry. Uh, and second to that, uh, different criteria for m materials. Yeah, so. I think the majority uh, at the moment, their materials are being qualified on uh, their performance in terms of like their strength, their, their functionality, their beauty, uh, and so on. Uh, in relation to energy, of course, uh, uh, which because uh, the energy transition has been there for a longer time, but we also have to add cr criteria uh, in terms of circularity, uh, reuse, uh, um, re re refabrication, refurbishment, etc. Uh, as well as the help of materials, because I always want to warn for the fact like, oh, we can create circularity and we can cycle uh, lots of bad and toxic materials, which you might call circular, but I think we have to take into account uh, the, the health perspective of the materials as well. Uh, number three um, is um, di 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 digitization of the built environment as an enabler because uh, the construction industry consists of many small companies, uh, organizations, etc. And there is a lack of standard standardization. Uh, and if we start the process of digitizing buildings, uh, we kind of get... Um, a copy of all the buildings that are there in a digital format, which will allow us to better manage uh, future reuse of buildings. And a fourth one is redefining value, because in a linear economy, as we have it today, where everything is planned to end up in waste, we also economically depreciate everything, or write everything down to zero. And what you were uh, asking earlier to Maria, for, uh, for example, like, oh, uh, do clients ask about uh, what if my building gets demolished? But in the end, they, well, they, they shoot also from the perspective of value, because if we believe 
uh, that materials can be reused over and over again, there will always be a value in your building. Um, and the picture here uh, of the painting uh, of R R Rembrandt serves as an example. There is only one of those. It's worth a lot of money being taken care of well. But if you zoom out on our Earth, we only have one Earth as well. And maybe to us, we seemingly have a lot of materials. But in the end, as, especially as the population grows, uh, these become very limited and scarce as well. So we should take care of them and make sure they maintain their value. Um, history and future of circular economy in the, the Netherlands. This is also meant, uh, these are some slides I uh, uh, was uh, so free to take from uh, the decks that we have at Holland Circular Hotspot. Um, if you look at it over 100, 150 years back, of course, the collection of waste and uh, the management of waste started from a public health per perspective, uh, the waste piling up in cities, etc. And later on, uh, this went more into environmental protection because we saw the, the drawbacks of so much waste, so many waste ending up in the environment. And this moved all the way, in the Netherlands at least, eventually towards uh, a circular economy plan. And you see the goals above are changing from public health, well, not changing, are adding on, I would say, uh, from public health to environmental protection to research management to the preservation of prosperity. And many people oftentimes still, well, that is my point of view, eh, believe or frame like, oh, we're doing this for the environment. Yes, we are. But I would dare to say in the end, we're doing it for us because the environment doesn't care. The environment evolves without an opinion on something. Uh, but it is about keeping the planet um, 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 li li livable for us and, well, and for other species. Uh, and that is what it is, uh, what it is about. And so the preservation of uh, prosperity entails many of these things. And therefore, in Holland, there is a plan uh, on the Netherlands circular in the year 2050, with all well the goals and objectives in order to uh, get there on time. And because of that, uh, some priority industries have been defined. You can read them here for your for yourself. Uh, um, but also, uh, one of them is the construction industry, on which I will uh, zoom in zoom in now. Uh, but basically, because the government has made these priority uh, industries, you see a lot of uh, um, um, activity and a lot of innovation going on in these areas, and also through a structured way in collaboration with government uh, in order to make the transition to a circular economy. Uh, one important element, construction related, that I always like to mention that I think in the collaboration of government, knowledge institutes and the industry is very important, is the development of standards. And we kind of mentioned it earlier, like, okay, are we doing the right things? Uh, are we going to discover that something else we didn't think of? Uh, and I think one element to prevent that as much as possible is to work with the same standards, the same terminology that if construction company A offers a circular building and construction company B as well, can the, the, the way it's being measured if something is circular cannot be compared with each other. Uh, and so in Holland there is a, a platform, a group uh, called Circular Buildings in 2023 that is working with expert groups from the different um, uh, branches I was mentioning earlier on defining how do we measure circularity as an industry? What do material passports, is one of them, what should material passports look like? What should be in there? What is circular procurement uh, like? Eh? So how do we stimulate the procurement of goods and services? And circular de design. Eh? How do we define what is a circular design? Now, and of course, the goals develop share knowledge, identifying barriers, and creating industry-wide agreements and standards for circularity. And you have similar developments on the European level as well. So I think for individual member states, uh, very important to hook on to, to these as well, uh, because in the end, the industry is international too. Well, my point of view, the opportunity for businesses, for many stakeholders, uh, focus on uh, the businesses here, is enormous, and there is no way back, because we as a society are moving towards circularity step by step. So I'll go over some best practices uh, very quickly because uh, I see 
uh, time is ticking by fast. Um, Modaster, the company uh, that I work for, uh, is uh, the goal is creating basically also a digital built environment so that we know exactly uh, w what materials are used where and in which way and what quality they are uh, to create a digital um, logbook, so to say, of these buildings. Uh, we have been working since the beginning of 2017 of this, and uh, the company is active uh, well, in Holland, but also Germany, Switzerland, uh, and Norway and Belgium. Um, and uh, this is scaling up. For example, one of uh, our clients and partners is a large developer. For example, is already facilitating 1,000 material passports a year uh, for their housing developments they are in. Are there Oh, my slides are moving. Okay, here I go. No, you guys have that as well? I hope it stays here. Yeah, they are running around. They are running around. Hopefully they will hang here for a moment. Uh, this is more material related innovation. Eh? So uh, how uh, can we make a bridge of, uh, of different materials instead of concrete and steel? Uh, here, more bio-based materials have been used. Um, so it's a way, different way of uh, looking at materials and, and the way to use them. Oh, here we go again. Park 2020 was the first uh, cradle to cradle um, uh, working environment office buildings, group of office buildings in uh, the Netherlands, uh, using the cradle to cradle design principles in which circularity, both circularity and health, is being integrated. It's a very successful business park uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, I'll try, hopefully, only one slide. No. Um, this is a building from uh, Leander, the, the, the uh, energy uh, network company in the Netherlands. It had many old buildings on, 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 on one side, one office building. And instead of demolishing them, uh, they have all been put together in a way, because with a big roof over all of them, uh, and fully refurbished to renovate, so 80% of the materials uh, have been reused on site, meaning that uh, the original structures kept on standing and serve kind of as uh, inside departments and, uh, and environments. And it shows how uh, this innovation um, is um, po 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 um, possible in many ways. Uh, there we go again. Um, another uh, technological innovation uh, is called uh, is, uh, concrete recycling. Uh, oftentimes, the uh, concrete just ends up uh, in large buildings underneath the road uh, as a foundation, and that's that. This innovation makes sure to be able to recover the uh, cement, the unactivated cement during the construction process back in the day. And this can be reused directly um, as a binding material in new uh, concrete, saving a lot of CO2 emissions. So these are some of the examples of innovations uh, currently taking place in the Netherlands. Then lastly, focusing for all of us basically, okay, what's the potential and what is the cost of inaction? I think the potential is uh, to work with the major stakeholders, government, businesses, and knowledge institutes, and citizens to create a jointly supported plan and execution strategy. Because if there is no um, one way, or not one way, but um, a guide on, on how to move step by step, uh, I think things will move slower. So developing standards, developing plans uh, with uh, these joint stakeholders is very important. Develop incentives. For example, governments can play a huge role in the procurement of all their goods and services, infrastructure and other services to stimulate demand and create a market because um, the market needs to get scale in order to be competitive to the linear uh, one that does not take into account uh, the environmental cost of things. And businesses have the opportunity to create entire new markets and business models. Uh, they should not see it as well, another sustainability thing we have to adhere to and that costs money, but a way to transform their business and um, maintain the value of the material that they use and also the return on investment on those materials. Let's say the cost of inaction is that companies that don't act will be out of business in the future because being linear will become less and less um, co competitive as the circular economy is scaling up. And governments that don't act won't have a competitive uh, economy in comparison to others. 
And I would say citizens that don't demand new things will continue to use and consume linear products and services that cost more and have a damage to the environment. So we all have a role to play uh, in pushing this transition forward. Uh, and with that, I, uh, I would like to close off. And if there are any specific questions from you in the audience or uh, uh, the other ones here, uh, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is MC Gadi Auta. I'm Lou Dismanto. I'm menti.com. Uh, so we can ask questions on menti.com, and the code is 28372075, and uh, you can send also your objections and so on. Um, I have one question, Rob, concerning this summer. Normally, when you're a wealthy country, then you can afford yourself to be very environmentally friendly, and uh, you can count on next 60 years, and you can... Uh, calculate into the project the demolition costs and reusing costs and then say, you know what, the cheapest way to build a building is to have those costs already in calculated in. And if you build projects for municipalities and, and, and the state, they could say it should be reusable and so on. But once you have floods like this summer, suddenly your people would say, you know what, we don't care, we're drowning. We don't care on 50, 60 years, we're drowning now. We, don't, we, we have to use the resources we have and now. Uh, how you deal with that vision, where that, I would say, urgency steps in? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, my take on this is that it is a um, gradual transition we're making from, from multiple angles. Uh, one of them is uh, developing incentives for the citizens themselves. I think, for example, green energy, putting solar panels on your roof, becomes uh, is already has already become much more of an investment and thing like, hey, I can earn this back within X amount of years. Uh, so I am doing it. Uh, a second one is um, regulation in building standards. I'm sure in Latvia yeah, there is uh, all sorts of regulations as well uh, in relation to... Uh, the type of, 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 of glass you have to use, uh, uh, insulation levels, you name it. Uh, and those have to be developed in the field of circular economy as well, so that that just becomes standard, that no questions are being asked on that level. And third, uh, the societal transition, I always like to make the comparison between when the Industrial Revolution started the uh, rights of workers were not being respected, yeah, unsafe environments, uh, no or little pay, etc., until the unions formed and stood up against that. And now, at least in, um, w w in the Europe and in well, many parts of the world, not all still, but uh, it is standard that employers respect security, safety, etc., of their employees. Nobody is debating anymore. Uh, oh, yeah, well, maybe I won't provide for the safety of my employees because there would be an outrage. And I think uh, that is a similar mental transition we have to be making uh, um, in this field as well. And those things go step by step. And your example with the floods, uh, well, I fully agree. People have other things on their mind uh, and, and therefore it doesn't always, always happen. But I think through these angles, uh, they still can move forward step by step. Mm -hmm. So you still keep the focus on, on uh, long term? Uh, yes, yes, yes. You'll have to, well, maybe others are able to pitch in uh, with some other angle of perspective on this because it's a good thing you ask and it's a complex uh, transition from that perspective. All right. Um, I'm just reminding this is session Green Buildings, How to Build According to the Principles of Circular Economy. Uh, it's supported by Embassy of the Kingdom of uh, the Netherlands. And we have also a guest from the Netherlands, uh, Rob Omen, circular economy expert. Also, Mar Schinke, leading researcher at Riga Technical University Institute of Materials and Structures and head of 3D concrete printing scientific laboratory. Then Maria Katrin Dambe, sustainable architect at Nomad Architects, specialized in the field of circular economy, bringing specialists together and uh, working with uh, them accordingly. Jan Sikonix, Director of Riga Energy Agency, on the energy questions also and sustainability. 
And we will also ask you to send in your questions, menti.com, and the code is 28372075. And I have one question starting Yanis and Maria. Let's talk about Latvia. What is happening in Latvia? We just saw uh, the situation in the uh, Netherlands. What is comparable and what is absolutely, totally different? Uh, Janis, buddy? So, maybe, sorry, I will start to, uh, sure. with uh, the city of Riga. So, we are implementing the uh, urban program project Urge, and uh, this is basically where we are going uh, the same steps, maybe as, as Rob showed, uh, starting how we can implement uh, this, these principles on the city of Riga. And uh, we are actually very glad, and we see that. Uh, uh, countries like Netherlands and uh, other large cities ha have already developed you know, instruments, uh, guidelines and, and other things and this is where we just need to have this uh, experience uh, transmitted in, in Latvia and in, in Riga. And um, you know, if more precisely about the project, so we are developing guidelines for our um, municipality workers, also for, for other uh, other users, and there will be seven type of uh, different guidelines how, how, how to follow the circular economy principles when you are uh, ordering or, or building or if you are selling materials and and this kind of stuff. So we have also uh, arranged our working group uh, with, with the stakeholders where we, we have uh, representatives for uh, building uh, materials, uh, experts from technical universities, uh, from municipality uh, workers, which are the people who can implement the, these actions from, from real estate department, from, from uh, Riga's Nampar organization. But it sounds like, I'm sorry, Jans, but it sounds like a very vast uh, amount of different interests coming together. And the question is, are you really sure that you can find a common sense in that mess, I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah I think that also Maria can, uh, can write later on add, but... Uh, uh, I think that's uh, one of the hardest challenge in, in general in circular economy because it, it relates to construction process and uh, it's always uh, with a lot of different stakeholders and uh, that's one of the problems. That the, there's no one gap. The gap is between all of the, the stakeholders. But uh, we have to start to, to go this uh, process uh, right now because uh, later on it can be uh, <laughs> not so late, but... Uh, but there could be some some problems, and uh, and I think that uh, these steps, starting from from the beginning with the working group, with the guidelines, and now if you have heard, we have this uh, uh, construction material um, exchange point in Riga, where uh, residents from Riga can uh, can take their leftovers from the renovation, take there, and somebody else can, can use this. And uh, this is like a pilot. We are testing how, how this could be managed, how this could be financed, what are the materials what people have, uh, what they need, and, and different things. And I think uh, that we are going further. We have heard that all of the actual stakeholders, they are interested, they understand this, but it's maybe the process, how we do this and mm -hmm. how we arrange these interests. Uh, one, uh, before we go to Maria, uh, two more things. One, are you saying that there would be materials which would be banned in Riga, for example, because they are not uh, circular? Uh, well, I don't think that this is uh, the question of the uh, city of Riga. It's uh, more in general European Union and also the country of Latvia. That's definitely what we are doing also in the project urge. It's uh, policy recommendations. But uh, you can relate this very similar as in condensing bulbs or, or other things that... Uh, we have to go this way because we see that there are a lot of research. I think there's no question about uh, about climate problems, and uh, but uh, the researches are about this that if we do not act now, mm -hmm. it's it's actually it's already late. But if we do not act now, we 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 cannot achieve nothing, and we all the time we are postponing our, our aims to the next year, to the next year, and to the next um, elections. To the next elections, exactly. So, but this is what we are doing, and uh, well. I would say that definitely in, in, in some time there will be some materials which are mm -hmm. uh, not preferred in the, in the construction. And other is Riga uh, or Latvia on, munici on municipal level uh, or state level ready for the projects which are not the cheapest, but they have, um, they have in them also the, this, this element of uh, circular economy. I think that it's, uh, it's a question how we look on this, what is cheap and what is not cheap. So from the investment point of view, of course, maybe it's a little bit more investment, but we have to look on the building life cycle. We have to, but are we looking? 
So, uh, well, I think that's why we are here, that uh, not always we would like to have this, and this is the field on which we are working. And mm -hmm. I think that we, we need to do this. We I think a lot of people understand that, but uh, when it comes to you, you say, okay, maybe you can do this, but I don't do this after. Yeah. You can, you can afford to, to, to be circular, not me, not today, not yet. Yes. All right, Maria, situation in Latvia. Um, I can actually add on a bit on these guidelines and the whole process. I'm also part in this urge project and the thing is, yes, it is really many involved parts and it can get messy, of course. Uh, but we try to structure this thing to really do it. There's the municipalities or governmental side, there's the builder, there's the design teams, there's the uh, actually user of the buildings, there is the demolition company, there is who manages the waste and so on. There are all these parts and uh, kind of try to map it who relates to whom. So understand who is directly affecting someone and maybe who is further in the chain and doesn't need to necessarily like immediately know what the other one is doing. So these guidelines are something they will also follow in uh, these multiple groups. So a building user or the one who comes and says I need the building, whether it's a municipality or a, just a private person, looks only at those things which are important for you when you yeah, come to an architect or someone and say, okay, I want the building and you have some like, things you should check on and that helps you to have a circular building. So that's the idea, to make this process a bit mapped out and easier to understand that it's not such a twisted thing. Have you had a situation where people come in with a project and you make it cheaper or more affordable or uh, faster bringing in some circular economy elements and, and they suddenly see the benefit from being uh, circular? Um, Right now, three days ago in Estonia, we did an art, kind of art public space installation uh, where we uh, tested this thing where material is a service. So you don't take a building material, then cut it, and then it becomes waste or something. You actually rent out the material from the shop, then you use it for a few days, and you give it back to the shop in the original form. And uh, in this case, it's timber. And as we know, the timber prices were skyrocketing, uh, which actually would have made that amount of timber very expensive and far away out of the budget. But because of this renting practice, we were way under the budget. So they saved a lot of uh, money in this process. Of course, it's complicated because you can't screw, you can't cut, because you want the material to stay one-to-one -one back in the way. But uh, it got way, way cheaper. So we get back to Lego principle, right? Yeah, kind of. Okay, all right. Uh, so then um, when the client comes to you, for example, Maria, and uh, maybe to other uh, our participants of discussion, uh, how, how, they, uh, how they get acquainted with the principles? Uh, how, how, at what point you start to talk about that? Right in the first meeting, I would say that is the starting point. We speak through the idea, like uh, what we try to do is speak through this life cycle. So understand what are the needs and understand what needs might change over time. So it's a kind of a strategy called uh, scenario-based planning. So you play out with the client the scenarios. Mm -hmm. Uh, what might happen, what are the needs, what might happen later. And I, I just can imagine me going to you um, uh, about my house. I just need a house. I have a place, I have uh, some, some idea. Then you come in with your circular uh, economy, then Jan steps in with his uh, sustainability and energy. Then uh, Rob says, but you know, in Netherlands, this and this material is uh, working better. And then uh, Maris, some, something is saying, and I, I'm saying, you know what? I'm staying in my flat or apartment. Uh, I don't need a new house. Uh, we really need to have an educated client to, to, to grasp all that. I would say, of course, an educated client is great, but the client doesn't need to know every single detail. The client needs to understand what he or she needs at the moment and what might be the few needs in near future. And then some of these design decisions or construction decisions and so on, they are 
they can be explained and told, but you don't need the client to understand it to the complete construction mm -hmm. detail. The client doesn't need to be the builder or the architect or something else. It's a, the client. So um, it's to explain why, how, maybe some simple tips if it's about adaptability of the space over time, how the client actually can change okay. the space, but it's not yeah, to educate the client to become the builder. Uh, 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 Rob? Yeah, I would like to add that I don't think we should, I like your questions very much because you really make us, you know, be um, on point and specific. Uh, I think in the example of the consumer who wants a new house or building, built a new house, at least if I speak for the situation in the Netherlands, for example, there are already so many rules and regulations on what uh, also environmental wise, on uh, most of energy folks on energy, on the specifications of the building levels, the insulation, uh, whatever I said earlier, types of glass, you name it, a lot. That a regular consumer who has no knowledge about the construction industry doesn't know, doesn't care, and doesn't need to know because that's why he has an architect and a construction company to arrange that for him. So. Uh, Partly these things have to be put into regulation and then they become standard. And if you talk about, because that's often the thing, of course, like, oh, it is more expensive. Um, that is slash was also the case with, um, with energy re related things. And what I always say, circular economy needs to get scale in order to become uh, competitive and eventually more competitive with the linear solutions we have to, um, today, so um, yeah, I would not confuse that the consumer has to know everything, I think, or they can know everything, but it is not needed uh, in order to convince them for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jans? Uh, yeah, I can completely agree. I think that uh, we need to inform uh, our consumers that uh, they, they would like to have this and that they understand the principles in, in general. But, uh, and then we as a municipality or government can uh, develop uh, templates, regulations, and that, that this process is much easier and also that you can have a look and uh, already compare materials or, or something like this. But, uh, and, and then actually the, the most important part I think is uh, people like uh, Mari, which uh, really understand this and they are those who are carrying the process through, through the way. Okay, we have a very, uh, very concrete question from our viewers. What is the worst material to use in construction concerning circular? Then what is the most environmentally unfriendly material and any substitute possible? Because there are sometimes maybe there's no substitute. We have to do it if we would like to go for this construction. Maris, anything on that? Uh, so, so the question was the worst material yes. that is still legal. That is yes. still legal, but the worst. <laughs> well, uh, it, it, from the construction industry and uh, looking from a climate perspective, uh, the cement, uh, cement that we use in concrete is, uh, uh, well, the worst material in the sense that it is uh, the single uh, most uh, CO2 creating material in the world, like so uh, accounting see, for five. It's a cement uh, printing guy. Yes, that's why we need to, because you must understand that cement is like uh, the, the ordinary Portland cement is the one that is, uh, uh, we are building so much with this type of uh, cement the, uh, and it uh, generates quite a lot of CO2 emissions. That's why in our laboratory we are, of course, already uh, searching for ways and already substituting this cement with other waste materials that is uh, how we can reduce this environmental impact. Uh, of course, we will not be able to uh, to live without cement and concrete. That's why, the, the, for example, what uh, Rob mentioned, this uh, like the smart crusher uh, that, uh, and the other ways how we can recycle cement uh, and uh, recycle concrete is uh, definitely uh, will. Uh, but those things will uh, come uh, slowly. And what 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 I see from uh, from uh, like large producers. Uh, uh, they often lack lack this uh, like incentive to do this uh, large scale uh, recycling using waste materials, and uh, uh, one of the ways how to in incentivize is uh, uh, through a financial uh, financial way. And 
probably if we talk about like some uh, climate catastrophe or that we are uh, doing so, uh, so much of uh, construction material, uh, this demolition waste landfilling, then probably some uh, taxes uh, on these things could also help because we are uh, talking about like uh, there's a carrot and a whip. Yeah, we are talking here about the carrot, uh, that how we can help. But maybe there's also needed some uh, some uh, extra measures because, of course, the market itself also uh, has some solutions uh, uh, how to reduce this environmental impact of the materials. So, but it is a, a complex a complex solution that will uh, come from uh, government uh, and and producers and and uh, everybody working mm -hmm. together. Uh, Maria, which uh, materials you don't use anymore, although you could? Um, expanded foam insulations. Expanded foam ins insulations. Um, so that the kind of that put us. Put the polystyrols. Yeah. All right. Uh, but it's still being used, right? It's official. It's okay. But you don't use it because? Uh, because of the firstly because of the environmental impact of it and other. Uh, not only the CO2, but the other like chemical basically effects. But um, another thing is in this point of circularity, that material in most cases is uh, glued to the building or the elements, which makes then in the case of disassembly uh, large issues. So it is way more time consuming and you most likely will damage but how this material the other. But but how to seal those gaps between the window and the building, for There's example? Construction tapes. So which are tapes. Very, yeah. Right. Uh, that's a way. <laughs> but uh, also it's uh, about insulating. Um, it's also often a question. Uh, of course, it depends on the ground conditions. It's uh, do you always need a concrete foundation for every single building? Uh, we have screw piles, we have a lot of alternatives mm -hmm. which are avoiding concrete and that insulation at the same time. So it's finding the best solution for each uh, each case. Mm -hmm. uh, Rob, what about those those uh, uh, foams uh, people are using for ceiling, uh, like window gaps and so on? Uh, are they still allowed, for example, in Netherlands? Or some other materials which are still legal but shouldn't be used? Um, I, the specific question about the insulation, the seals, uh, that I, I, I don't know. I, uh, I don't know to what extent what exactly is and is not allowed in the Netherlands. Uh, what I do know in terms of uh, insulation in between uh, the walls, for example, there are still many uh, types, uh, also the, 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 what is the word in, in English for that? Um, the, 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 the foam, the glass, um, Ah, uh, well, I forgot the, 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 maybe Aris can help me. Wool? Glass wool? See, glass wool, ex exactly, uh, are still um, allowed. And there is also many questions there about the, the reuse and recyclability of that at the end of its life. So in the Netherlands, we still have that problem as well, so to say. Um, and uh, in regards to materials, I agree on the element that cement has a big CO2 um, impact. And I think in general, uh, there has to be like a review. Eh? If, if you look at how cradle to cradle uh, principles uh, look at uh, the toxicity of materials. So I think in many applications, which of course have a technical performance um, objective, a lot, lots of type of, of um, Chemicals are being used in terms of like layers or types of paint or in order to offer a certain amount of protection to something. Uh, and I think a lot of work well, is being done and should still be done on reviewing to what extent these toxic materials can be replaced by an um, alternative. So you admit that there are sometimes situations where there's no alternative and you have to go for the, the material which is not very secular. Mm, it depends how you want to build, I think, with today's demands and qualifications on the, the, the type of materials we use, yes. But can you build a house with only um, natural and, and healthy materials? Of course, because it has been happening for hundreds of years. But of course, then you get different disadvantages as well. So 
That's another thing I would like to ask uh, is uh, on the choice of materials because maybe they are quite circular, but on the other hand, we are losing uh, forests uh, on the other end uh, of that uh, decision uh, because we are talking about innovations or going back to the basics and then uh, on the other end, it starts whole new problem or renews that problem. That's another thing. How to decide concerning all the elements, what is circular and what's not? Yeah. Janis, May uh, Mari, uh, oh. Rob, Maris. Oh, or just to quick, quickly one point, uh, one, I think we also have to let go of the imagination that, uh, in the case it lives here, that circular economy uh, has no impact. Yeah. Uh, we we do not eliminate environmental impact with circular economy. We reduce it, but as long as we humans are here, we keep on using things. There is a certain impact, and I think we uh, that's the thing that should be stated in the from the start. Mm -hmm. I'll let others add on to that. that uh, it, well, it depends with who with what we are comparing. And uh, it, it always it's a comparison with, with something. And for example, with, with forests, uh, of course, yes, you if you will build all the buildings from, for, uh, from from wood, it will take more from forest. But on the other hand, it's better than uh, than to burn it. And uh, uh, well, in, when you burn it, you you release CO2 emissions. But when you insert it in the building, so you store them in the form of of wood. And if you have uh, done exactly like uh, Marie told, you can later on use it. Uh, for for swings, for example. Mm -hmm. So and uh, but we need this comparison with what we com compare, and uh, that's why I think what Mars told this environmental assessment or this this passport where we something we can compare the materials for each case. Uh, I think that from my side that, that's what what's important that we can start to really see on the figures on, on calculations and have this uh, evaluation. So we talk about lesser evil not being just perfect. <laughs> Well, once again, if you use uh, re reused materials already now, and this can be done with uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, cement, mm -hmm. like uh, Rob showed in the presentation, or maybe some recyc pl recycled plastic or, or wood, I think that uh, I have seen even some best practice examples where from the CO2 emission point of view, the building stores more than, than emits. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, there are also not a, CO2 is not the only. Uh, of course, so um, we'll have uh, like also a few questions from the audience if you are ready. Uh, but you still can send them on menti.com. Uh, Maria, I will ask you uh, if you know any pilot projects where circular uh, buildings are being built and tested. But Maris, before uh, you had something to comment on on this. Yes, uh, uh, regarding the materials, because the previous uh, question also was what, what, what would be the best material to build, then uh, I think that the bio-based building materials are uh, really the ones uh, to look forward to. Um, they are the ones that, uh, are what uh, Jan is told, that can store a CO2, because uh, when plants grow, they store CO2 in, 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 them, in themselves, and then we store this CO2 in our buildings. So that uh, is one of the... Um, materials to uh, look forward to uh, use uh, if we want to uh, yeah, limit this uh, climate catastrophe that is uh, yeah, happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Maria, Jans, maybe and Maris, maybe you know any uh, real projects in Latvia, circular buildings or plans, projects at least. I think we have some projects where some aspects are tested, whether it's adaptability or it's using. Uh, Massive timber, leaving open connections so we can disassemble things. Uh, yeah, some installations as we use, some testing, some reuse, and something we don't have something where everything is like according to the circular economy. Mm -hmm. Sadly, not yet, but hopefully soon. But we have things yeah. where a bit of those strategies is tested. Yeah, well, I think one of the things which uh, Maria thought is uh, is a uh, library of Lover City. So there there have been uh, some some joints tested and some principles, and you can see actually in the Energy Agency Facebook account that we have the video with the interviews and uh, and uh, and you can check that out. Uh, but uh, I know that there are examples in in businesses uh, in in large office buildings uh, where they these principles are. Uh, are uh, 
implemented and uh, I think it's one of the questions also for those who think that the circular economy is not important uh, ask this question so why the business is doing this so what are the values why they do this but uh, I, maybe I do not want to mention some 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 company names or, or something like this but they are and uh, uh, and I think that our mission is also to to tell the story mm -hmm. of, about these best practice examples and we have a pilot project for example that swing by Maria yes you can see it here and touch it and uh, what was the percentage of reused material well, that's hard to say the one thing what I have mentioned of course the bearing construction is not reused because it's not possible in the legal framework of Latvia we can't have reused material which bears something because ah. we don't have the uh, certification which provides is it uh, so there's no organization which would say that this reuse material can bear that particular uh, yeah, weight, way, for example. Yeah, we would have to do a lot of strength testing, which is expensive. Yeah. So what is done is taken then new timber for the uh, construction, but it's done with this large joinery which is open and exposed. The timber is not treated, so if it's taken, it's not creating toxic, uh, mm -hmm. the hazardous waste. Um, and then we have reuse things and everything else basically. Uh, it's everything from the planters which are old beans from Rutska Faya when they happened. We have the um, seating elements that are mixed uh, concrete with leftover wood bits. We have football grass uh, from an old football field which was taken off. The rest of football grass was reused in another field but they have these cutoffs which were basically plastic waste. That um, takes a lot of coordination actually. Yeah. There's, with the football grass is a funny story, in a playground we can't have actually wooden seats because if a child gets hit, uh, it's not the best case, so um, there was from the town hall the inquiry about plastic seats, which taking new plastic is uh, <laughs> not the best case, um, so actually we have wrapped the wooden seats in this football grass, which is very soft, so we kind of uh, found a way around and yeah, it's a lot of try, search, and what you can do, mm -hmm. what you can't do. So we have a good example, actually, and, and lots of elements to be tested. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very briefly, any questions here from the audience? Wow. Right. Uh, so let me see you in person. Yeah, who you are and what's your question? I'm a mechanical. I'm interested about the legality of the materials used. So, for instance, you need to build a house, you need insulation, you could use, for instance, some old cellulose books, whatever you found, but how can you actually make it legal uh, for the bull bulb, the inspection, to actually admit that it's okay, because you need the minimum insulation requirements? The cellulose, that I can immediately answer, we can in Latvia buy uh, cellulose insulation, with it, which is from recycled newspapers already, so... You have it yourself, uh, that's hard because you would have to be able to pro prove with data actually that that one can do it. So best case would be possibly to get in contact with the company which produces that and see if you can give your material in a way through them. That would be my guess, what I would do in, okay, in that case. So it's uh, finding someone who does it and then checking with them. Uh, but yeah, you need some certain levels achieved. Uh, what is the experience in Netherlands, Rob, uh, on, the, on the certification of, of reused materials? Um, I would say that has not, um, it has been done. It's not a common thing yet because we, we run into similar challenges. Exactly the example that Maria was giving, like if you reuse like a steel, uh, a steel beam, uh, does it have the certification of bearing the weight and so on? Uh, there have been um, individual um, uh, pilots where also the government or a certification institute have worked together with the actual pilot uh, in order to, for that specific pilot, provide a certification to make that happen. Uh, but it is still a challenge in Netherlands as well, especially for in terms of uh, health and safety requirements. Uh, through which I think certain elements or materials cannot be reused at the value you would like it to be reused. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, one more question. 
uh, I'm a junior student in Riga Business School, and uh, I'm asking this question is more like a uh, sort of a debate if uh, the re reusable materials actually friendly or for environment. If you count up the retransportation, the storage, and uh, the CO two emissions that. Pro uh, Produced by, you know, you relocate those material and storage them, and then uh, disassemble them, and then again put them on building. This is whole process adds up together. Does is it really environmental friendly compared to we just build a new building from a new material that could possibly last a longer time than the, if you add up this whole process together? If it really so the whole cycle thing. So yeah, actually, yeah, you just already answered. That's where the life cycle assessment comes in handy, where we actually can compare the logistics. So all this transportation, where we get the material from, and where we need to get it to. But of course, in the circular economy, we have to understand it's not only about CO2 levels, it's also about resource consumption. And there's a lot of overconsumption in many fields we have happening. So. Sometimes the answer is actually we don't have enough to always build new. At some point, some things are actually we are running out of, so we have to anyway recirculate them. Uh, yeah, no matter if it would be better to have new or old. But uh, thank you, Rob. Yeah, I'd like to add to that a few things. Uh, um, that you have to, of course, with life cycle assessment, but very practically speaking or you transport the material or the, the element from one building to another with storage in between, or you have, the mine, have to mine the material from somewhere far away, which has to go to a factory to be produced. And you have all those steps always as well. Um, and on top of that, two, two more things. Uh, as we're moving towards um, a transition uh, towards uh, uh, um, electrifying our transportation system that, eh, not now, eh, but uh, in the future, all transport takes place with energy that, eh, with renewable energy, the, um, the, the energy impact of this transportation uh, um, in some situations might become smaller as well. And I think that's a thing to take into account. And of course, the resource scarcity too. But you made a very good point, like you have to take into account the thing you're going to reuse. Will that last, for example, only five years compared to a new material that lasts 30 years? And that's a very important consideration to make uh, to judge uh, if the environmental impact is high or low. Um, I've, I've been hosting these uh, discussions for, for some time. Uh, and uh, this question about the life cycle assessment always comes more or less from the skeptics. So be aware, be careful with this. <laughs> because, of course, it's, uh, if something is very complicated, let's don't do this. But if you are a student, I trust your intentions were good. So thank you very much for your questions. And uh, thank you, uh, dear experts, for being here on this very complicated matter and trying to do something about that. Uh, one last sentence from each of you to the audience, to our listeners. I uh, really liked the uh, one from Rob. Uh, environment doesn't care. We do it for us. So, yes, we are here for us. Uh, the, this earth has survived uh, so many calamities. The earth really doesn't care. We should do. Uh, anything else to add on this, Jans? Yeah, I would say let's start with us, with ourselves, uh, with our everyday actions. and. Uh, and then uh, move forward, uh, involve our neighbors, our, our relatives, and, uh, and uh, let's start with us. So I think that's the most important. All right, Mari. Yeah, so I would add, let's start right now because we have everything we need to start now and then assess and evaluate how good we are doing later. But then I had to ask, uh, ask Madison and Rob, okay, we are here because you started with yourself. What about the others? How we can involve those also? Um, uh, about the others, uh, uh, in, I, I would say this uh, call to action for everybody would be uh, to uh, uh, what also from Rob, this was a redefining value. Uh, 
if we have a, an existing building, do we really need to demolish it? If we have a, a new build, we need a new building, do we need these uh, extra square meters? Yeah, we, can, uh, we need to uh, uh, design it smart, uh, and if we're designing it smart, that's a way we can save uh, resources and save also uh, uh, money uh, today. So uh, I, I think the idea of re redefining value is something that we need to do all uh, today. Thank you, Maris. Rob? Uh, well, adding on to, to that similar point, that redefining value, very con concrete there in the industry. We have seen over this past year the prices of raw materials increasing by 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 percent. Imagine you have a building, you had designed a building 30 years ago, that you're going to demolish it today in such a way you can take apart all these materials. Eh, that, uh, the residual value of your building will be higher. So uh, I think, especially in today's economic um, environment we're in, uh, you can see that actually building with circularity in mind uh, will make sure you, your your um, um, asset that you have maintains value. And the last thing I want to add for everyone, I think we have to we have been grown up in a, since after the Second World War with an economy. That's always about more, more, and more. Eh? So more production, more things, more. But if you really look at it, do we really have more or do we just push through more things? And I think we have to step away from this thing always more and new towards what do we already have and, and, and what can we maintain? It makes life cheaper and better as well, you know? So uh, with that, I'd like to close off. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was Rob Oman, circular economy expert. Mar Shinka, leading researcher at Riga Technical University and 3D concrete printing scientific laboratory man. Then Marie Katrin Dam, a sustainable architect at Nomad Architects, and you can see her also work here uh, in circular way done. And Jan 